No, no, it, it's it's actually quite remarkable. What's remarkable is that the West paid hardly any attention. Maybe we could, should say no attention to what Putin and his lieutenants were saying. They completely ignored uh, the Bill Burns memo. And I would imagine that once we get our hands on the historical documents, all the historical documents, we'll see that Burns was not the only one who was telling people uh, at the top of the Bush administration uh, that this was what was going to happen. So it, it does seem to me that Russia's response to this relentless push of uh, NATO to, or of the U.S. to have NATO, a U.S.-led military alliance, expand was, uh, was rational. But maybe uh, to get to that, uh, if you could explain what, what you uh, and uh, Sebastian Rosado mean by the term rational, because it is a loaded yeah. or a, a debated uh, and unclear term. Uh, how do you operationalize that? And since we're talking also not about an individual decision or uh, a uh, an individual person who could be rational or delusional and so forth, but rather a state. What is a state in this context uh, specifically, and how would you assess whether the state is acting in a rational way? Yeah, this is a great question. Let me just quickly lay out my definition or my, my and Sebastian's definition of rationality and then answer your question head on. Uh, our argument is that rationality has two dimensions to it. First is the individual, and then there's the collectivity or the state, because as you point out, you can't just focus on one individual because decisions are made by a handful of people. There's surely a leader like Putin, but Putin is surrounded by other people who have input. So it's a collective decision or a state decision. And our argument is that at the individual level, what's imperative for rationality is for individuals to have a credible theory about how the world works that underpins their view of policy. We believe that human beings are fundamentally theoretical animals. We call this homo theoreticus. I like and, that, by the way. <laughs> yes. Right. And that when you, Jeff Sachs, think about, you know, what uh, economic policy should be uh, in Washington, you think about the world as an individual in terms of theories about how the world works. You have these economic theories. And when you look at international relations, you have political theories that inform your thinking. But that's just the individual level. Then there's the collective level, right? And our argument is you're often going to run into situations where you have different individuals who have different theories and therefore favor different policies. And to get a collective decision, to get a state policy, what you have to do in our story is have a deliberative decision-making process. You can't have a process that looks like the one before the Iraq war where Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld suppressed all sorts of uh, conflicting views or views that they didn't like. You have to have a robust and coherent decision-making process. And we argue uh, in, in the Russian case that that's what happened. As you know, the conventional wisdom in the West is that Putin was isolated and that he made this decision to invade Ukraine all by himself. And there were all these people who disagreed with him, but he exiled them or he didn't listen to them. And it's the fact that he was a lone ranger that makes this irrational. This is wrong, we believe. And in fact, to go back to the Bill Burns memo, the Bill Burns memo makes it clear that Putin was not a loner here, that virtually everybody at the top of the foreign policy establishment in Russia agreed with Putin about NATO expansion. So our argument is, at the individual level, what you had is a set of Russian leaders, including Putin, of course, who were operating on the basis of balance of power theory, right, and therefore had a credible policy. Right. And at the collective level, they agreed on what had to be done to deal with the problem. They believed to a person, I think, that, and the Bill Burns memo confirms this, that NATO expansion into Ukraine had to be stopped. 
And the end result is that on February 24th, 2022, we got a war. And, you know, I think uh, one of the telling documents, again, that really supports uh, your view is the readout, or, or even the, it's almost a verbatim minutes of the Russian Security Council meeting. I think it's February 21st, uh, 2022. Yes. Uh, is that right? Yes. Uh, that uh, basically, uh, it's a very or- organized meeting, uh, and President Putin lays out the issue, what shall we do, colleagues? Uh, and then he calls on Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, and then he calls on uh, other experts. Then he calls on uh, people from the regions. And you get a full readout. We very rarely get that from the United States uh, documents because these things are uh, kept secret. I think the Russians uh, wanted this uh, to be understood. But it's actually a very orderly deliberation, and it obviously reflects a lot of orderly processes that repeated it. It's not one person. It's not President Putin pounding the table and say, we must do this. Quite the contrary. Uh, Lavrov explains, we made this uh, this entreaty to, uh, or uh, this uh, approach to the U.S., but they sent back a document on such and such date saying they would not negotiate over NATO. And then the next one gives another answer. The next one gives another answer. And then the meeting is summed up by the president. But, it, but it's a very deliberative, orderly process that no doubt you get the feel reflects a lot of orderly attention to high stakes issues, but actually through a deliberative process. Jeff, can I just jump in here and uh, reflect on one of the insights uh, from our book? Uh, a lot of people believe that when it comes to collective decision making, when you're at the state level, there's a difference between how authoritarian states and democracies operate. And uh, almost everybody we talk to in the West believes that democracies believe in deliberation. But authoritarian states are the opposite. And what you have is one leader who runs roughshod over everybody else. And this, of course, fits with the conventional wisdom on Putin. He doesn't listen to anybody. He decides what to do. And then anybody who disagrees gets sent to the gulag and anybody who agrees gets promoted. So you have all these yes men and yes women who are operating under him. This is the way many people in the West think. Our view in looking at all these cases, and we looked at 14 cases in great detail, is that there's no difference between authoritarian states and democracies. In both cases, both sets of cases, you get a small number of people at the very top who make collective decisions. And what you discover in almost every case is when people are trying to formulate policies about grand strategy or how to deal with a particular crisis, what you see is that nobody, including the leader, is really sure what to do. And they're kind of searching around in the dark, trying to figure out what the best policy is. Therefore, leaders are prone to listen to their lieutenants about what might be a really good idea. If you take Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel today, whatever you think of Benjamin Netanyahu, he is in real trouble. The Israelis are in real trouble, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with Hamas. I am absolutely certain that Netanyahu is listening to anybody who he thinks might have a good idea about how to proceed. And someone like Naftali Bennett, who he might have terrible relations with otherwise, is a very smart man. And I'm sure that someone like Netanyahu will listen to Bennett just because Netanyahu is not sure what to do. And if Bennett has a good idea, he'll take that good idea and run with it. So my bottom line here is I don't think that Putin's behavior is any different uh, in this authoritarian state, which Russia is, than would be the case if Russia were a democracy. You, in each case, have a small number of people at the top who make decisions and have a vested interest across the board in listening to others' ideas. I think, uh, you know, I, I that really comports uh, with the, my uh, uh, perception also of China, which is very institutionalized, uh, very bureaucratic. It's, it's been an administrative state for 2,000 years. 
with a lot of discussion, a lot of deliberation, uh, not uh, one person calling uh, any shots at all, but actually really a collective decision making in exactly that way. And I wonder, it, in a way, there is a, an irony that sometimes happens uh, in our democracy. I, I have a feeling, uh, let me ask you about this, you know, many of the decisions that are taken are taken absolutely against or uh, with no interest in, in American public opinion, though in our you know, self-assessment, uh, 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 democracy also means reflecting the will of the people, but on many of these issues, the people are not asked, they're told, or uh, they're ignored. But often it happens that to get some decision made in foreign policy in our ostensibly a uh, public-driven process, the public is lied to. Uh, lied to about the real situation on the battlefield or lied to uh, about uh, the, uh, the real reason for going to war and so forth. And so maybe there's even more secrecy and less deliberation in the democratic setting in some cases because you, you don't speak the truth. I mean, the, the lead up to the Iraq war was a desire of a small group to have a, a war to overthrow Saddam Hussein on pretextual reasons uh, that turned out to be completely false, maybe even more false than they, they believed, but certainly they uh, were not very much interested in the evidence that, that they were purporting to uh, give to the American people. So it was a deception. And because of the deception, I'm just wondering whether maybe the deliberation is even cut short in such context because too much talk, too much deliberation lets too much of the public in and they didn't want to let the public in. Yeah, let me uh, directly address this issue, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about. First of all, in the book that Sebastian and I have written on how states think, what we discovered is that public opinion, what the public thinks, domestic politics, uh, and so forth and so on, matters hardly at all in the decision-making process. The elites, a small number of elites, get together and they make the decision. We were actually surprised by this finding. We didn't go in uh, thinking that this was a question we should address, how much domestic politics matters. But we discovered in looking at 14 cases and looking in a cursory way at a lot of other cases that domestic politics doesn't matter. That's point one. Point two is there's no It's amazing. Question. It's a stunning finding and a very <laughs> important one. Yes. And again, it wasn't one that we went in asking about, a question we asked, went into the book asking about. Okay. Second point is that if you are in a democracy and you make a particular decision, you have to sell it to the public. There's no question about that. That's not as necessary in an autocracy. It's not to say it's completely unnecessary because public opinion does matter somewhat, but it's definitely necessary in a democracy. Now, I wrote an earlier book called Why Leaders Lie. And the principal finding in that book is that leaders do not lie very much to other leaders, and they lie mainly to their publics. Yep. And you get more lying in democracies than in okay. autocracies. There you go. I, there you go. I, I believe that. I really believe that. <laughs> and, and And I think... Sometimes you just feel it's it's a nonstop narrative and deception, and, and you know one of the uh, senior people in uh, in the Biden administration on another issue, and I don't want to say who and what and what the context was, but uh, I I said, well, you know, have you weighed in on this? And they said, no, uh, you, you know, only only the the spin guys uh, in in the White House uh, have any any role in that right now. It's all about narrative, how you pitch it, not what the substance is. Cause this was, you know, is there really that deliberation over that particular issue? And, and there was very little, actually. 
Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, when I wrote Why Leaders Lie, and I would go around the country and I would tell people that leaders do not lie much to each other. People found that hard to believe, right? And then when I said that leaders in democracies are especially prone to lying to their publics, people found that hard to believe. But I would just say to you, the reason that people in democracies or the people inside a country are easy to lie to is because those people tend to trust their government. Because after all, it is your government. You expect them to protect you. They're your leaders. So they're primed to be deceived. When you're dealing with foreign leaders, they don't trust each other to begin with. We don't trust Putin. Putin doesn't trust us. And this goes back to 2000 when he took power, right? It's not just now in 2023. So given that there's not much trust to begin with, you really can't get away with lying at the international level like you can at the domestic level. Oh, that's yeah, that's that's really something. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011. Typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. So how do you create this miracle? Because even the possible uh, alternative to Biden is Trump or somebody from the Republican. They are in certain aspects even more radical pro-Israeli than the Democrats. Uh, how to overcome this tiny problem? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the pressure has to come uh, from inside the United States and from outside. Uh, from inside, public opinion absolutely does not accept the administration line on this. This is very clear in opinion survey after opinion survey. So somebody in the White House uh, concerned about uh, Biden's reelection must be reading this uh, and must be understanding this is just purely bad tactics from a U.S. political point of view. That's very important. Uh, there's lots of protest in the United States uh, and uh, lots of uh, unhappiness with this. So we're not in any way locked in internally to the politics. It's bad for Biden. Uh, it's bad for U.S. interests. Uh, it's against public opinion. Um, and so this is uh, one point that I would make. It's not like the United States is rousing support. Yes, and it's impossible to turn. Uh, it's actually deeply contested and mainly opposed. Though I acknowledge that in Washington, the pro-Israel lobby has always been very powerful. The military industrial complex is very powerful and the inertia is also powerful. So I'm not saying it's easy. Now on the outside, the entire world uh, is basically aligned on this side with one important footnote, which is that uh, a few European countries uh, maybe are not aligned. I don't know what the Austrian government's real position is. Sometimes it's uh, don't, you know, side with the U.S. or maybe it really is uh, because of more right wing uh, view or whatever uh, side with Israel. But it's very few. The problem in Europe is European politicians stop telling the truth about almost anything years ago because all they want to do is side with the United States. And mm -hmm. I think I would just say to European politicians, if you do it, 
you lose at the polls. There isn't a popular government in Europe right now that it, because it's incredible. This is so much against European Europe's own political interests. So I would say think through this honestly, and then say you know it's right. We need we're not against Israel. Mm. <laughs> we just need to move to a two state solution. And the United States, you know, come over here, buddy. You know it too. Let's let's move to a real solution. I'm waiting for European politicians to regain two feet on the ground, their head out of the clouds or out of uh, U.S. control, and just state clearly, straightforwardly what is right and also what happens to be in Europe's interest. But by the way, what happens to be in Israel's interest as well, because nothing that's happening is uh, doing anything other than gravely threatening Israel's long-term survival. This messianism, this greater Israel idea, this zealotry of this religious group, this is not saving Israel. This is threatening Israel's survival. So I want European leaders just to think clearly and honestly about this, because that'll also help the United States get to the right place. I think there is a lot to say about the European leaders. I think the, the European leaders, uh, uh, there are no leaders, you, you know it better. And there is another tiny problem. We will have also an election this year in some European countries, uh, but in the European Union for the European Parliament. And the problem is that everybody, if according to most of the polls, it's to foresee that the right-wing uh, European nationalistic right-wing parties will win. And the problem is they are even at least concerning Israel, they are also in the meantime, also many of their parties, if to go back history, you know where they come from. And this is a historic cynicism. I think that these right-wing uh, fascist parties, now they are outside of Israel, which is yeah. unbelievable for anybody who knows history and who knows how things uh, happened that these parties who are sometimes in internal uh, issues, they are racistic, they are fascistoid right today, but when it comes to Israel, they are supporting the Jewish state. Yeah, you know, su supporting the Jewish state is, uh, um, is one thing, supporting what is called greater Israel to dominate the Palestinians is so uh, senseless for Israel and for Europe uh, that uh, everybody should take a deep breath and understand that. How many self wounds does Europe want? How many crises, how many wars does Europe want around it? Uh, and I would ask uh, the European leaders, you know, th the reason why the right is growing is in part because the so-called center or center left all was gung ho with the United States for NATO enlargement and for the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it's been a disaster for Europe. It's been a disaster economically for Europe. It's been a disaster from a security point of view for Europe. So it's not even left right. It's it's a failure policy that the current European governments have pursued, and they are opening up their way for an opposition to arise. Uh, and that's that's what's happening, in fact. So the reason European politicians, by the way, across the board, you, you look at the approval ratings in Western Europe right now or in the EU, nobody has any support, basically, except the few that stand up for themselves, like Orban or, uh, or Fico or uh, mm -hmm. a, a few others. But the ones that are basically just siding with the United States in this useless Ukraine war, 
are all in their 20% approval ratings or 25% approval ratings and so on. So the main point I would say to Europe is if you go the way, not of supporting Israel, that's one thing, but supporting greater Israel for ethnic cleansing and for this terrible thing, all you're doing is making another prolonged disaster on Europe's borders. And if that's in Europe's interest, boy, please explain it to me. This is this is no doubt about it. I think uh, Europe. I think with this uh, policy, they they uh, follow the last uh, tens of years. I think they it's against their own security, economic, even cultural interests. I think this is something uh, which you know. I'll give you another example. By the way, uh, the, the the politics of the twenty tens was dominated uh, by the Syrian refugees. And anyone that knows even the slightest history should understand that uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011, typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that? explain that to the public, not one. So then they wonder why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left, it's a matter of What's Europe's interest right now? It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. And so European politicians should think about how to defuse a Mideast wide war. You are, you are completely right. I think you convince uh, people like me, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> we are not in, uh, in power and, uh, uh, but coming back to uh, the issue of this uh, uh, interview. I think now there is a, a, a peace plan. It's even economically, we didn't even mention it, but uh, which is interesting for me, since you are uh, uh, also uh, long experienced in economy, I think um, one uh, important, but not so much debated uh, uh, proposal is uh, the establishment of a new UN fund, uh, uh, a UN Reconstruction and Sustainable Development Fund, which, which is uh, interesting, should partially, at least partially, funded by reduction of expenses which traditionally have been spent for armament and war. You know, uh, uh, outside the UN, across the street uh, from uh, headquarters, is what they call Isaiah's Wall, uh, which is the inscription of uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, which says, uh, they uh, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, nations uh, will not uh, uh, make war uh, uh, on uh, other nations, neither will they teach war anymore. I'm uh, paraphrasing, but uh, you know, Isaiah had the idea in the eighth century BCE of the uh, transforming the military to the civilian use. Uh, and uh, we're now spending two and a half trillion dollars a year worldwide on the military. The United States is around 40% of the world's spending shocking because we're four percent of the world's population uh what if we take even 10 percent of that would be 200 billion dollars a year uh so two and a half uh, i'm sorry 250 billion a year uh and so that's the proposal uh create a fund funded by uh basically uh, agreed cutbacks in armaments I should mention that uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, in his encyclical uh, Popolorum Progressio in uh, 1967, had that idea. So I don't want to claim uh, any uh, uh, any uh, 
uh, precedence uh, to this, but I do think it's the right idea. The UN in general does not command much in financial resources. Uh, it needs to have a bigger budget to do good things. And uh, one way would be military cutbacks that are rechanneled to sustainable development. We could continue hours and hours and hours since uh, many things have been already uh, discussed uh, for many years, but it's interesting that now this plan is here. I think, uh, do you have any uh, ideas how to make it even more popular? Do you uh, intend to present it to other international bodies? Uh, and how should this come to reality? I'm uh, discussing uh, these ideas with UN diplomats uh, all the time. Uh, and I've discussed it with the uh, Palestinian uh, diplomats and with diplomats from around uh, the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of resonance with this. I personally am continuing to urge an immediate membership of Palestine in the UN uh, as a UN member state. Um, by the way, Palestine is a state recognized by 140 uh, other states, but it is not recognized as a UN member state, uh, only an observer, as you rightly pointed out. So I am continuing my own discussion of this. Um, basically, uh, with the US government, they don't talk to me too much, uh, but I uh, try to make my views uh, known uh, publicly uh, by uh, writing and posting uh, articles all the time. Um, and uh, I'm writing to politicians in the US who are quite resistant in general because uh, uh, their modus operandi for decades has been never show any, any space at all with Israel. But I'm telling them it's not working. Uh, it's not working from any point of view. You need to rethink this. So they have a few days of rethinking before the Congress uh, comes back. Uh, the White House cannot be uh, very comfortable. We hear lots of stories about pretty harsh talks between the U.S. and Israel right now. I believe that that's true. One of the U.S. Uh, carrier groups <coughs> has been withdrawn from the eastern Mediterranean and is on its way back to the U.S., that is a signal that the U.S. does not want a wider war in the Middle East. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. The U.S. is exhausted of war and an election year. Uh, it would uh, be the end of uh, Biden's chances at all. So uh, this is the time for pushing the politics because it's a case where the right thing to do the politically expedient thing to do uh, are the same. Uh, and so I'm going to continue to push hard on that. Do you have any hope in, I think you mentioned it and everybody knows it, I think two thirds of the international uh, states are in favor of this kind of political and economic uh, solution, unfortunately, uh, they don't have any veto uh, at the UN. But there is something else. There is an uh, increasing number of states working together, I think. Uh, and the South African move to the international court is interesting because South Africa, on the other side, is one of the leading uh, member states of this newly established group, the BRICS uh, group. Uh, so. And they have even already established a kind of new banking system, financing system. Do you have any indications or ideas that from this side, uh, more than just political statements will come to support your suggestions? Well, the, the BRICS countries, all of them are on the same side that I've been advocating, uh, China, Russia. Uh, South Africa, uh, India has expressed uh, also uh, some clarity on this, um, Brazil certainly, um, and now you have new BRIC states that have just joined, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Iran. It's a powerful group, 
they're all on uh, this side. Uh, actually, it's interesting for me, the fact that Iran is now a BRICS member is, is actually going to moderate uh, Iran, make it uh, part of what could be a BRICS-wide consensus uh, on uh, a good solution. So this matters because uh, the U.S. also looks out and says, you know, our diplomacy, we're isolated, whereas China's and Russia's diplomacy is growing in the region. This cannot make anyone happy. And we know that in the U.S. State Department, there's a lot of unhappiness about the U.S. administration policy. We don't hear all the details, but it boils over uh, every few weeks. And so we hear about the protests coming from inside the professional diplomatic service of the United States as well. So I wouldn't give up uh, in any way on a, a political change where the United States one day says, you know, we, we need to move forward to a real solution here. Uh, this is uh, where I think uh, uh, it's very appropriate and timely to think straight. And if the European leaders are too afraid to say it in public, they should be saying it, they should be saying it in private to their American counterparts. They should, yeah. So I think it's time. I think we exceeded a little bit our usual limit. So thank you very much, Professor Sachs. I think it was very interesting. It's important. And I think we should really invest more and more time to publish these ideas and maybe even outside the usual normal circles we have in New York, in Brussels, uh, because the world is much bigger and in the long run more, more or less more powerful than the world which runs the business till now, but it will come to an end. And the Palestinian-Israeli issue could be, we forgot something, because the Palestinian issue, what is it in, in history? It's a colonial problem. It, it's it's it. one it's one of the last unsolved colonial problems, and it's more than hundred years after formerly colonialism was ended. It's time to deal with the remaining rests, and Israel Palestine is one, and this should be uh, one of our ambitions to to a political outcome right now, not the one we wanted. But we were so dumb not to take a better deal a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that now we're in a situation where we're not going to get exactly what we, quote, want. But to continue the fighting would absolutely destroy even more. What worries me most is actually that really the lives of Ukrainians are just taken as a, as a casualty, as something not even worth speaking about. They don't as... even talk about it. The no. leadership no. is absolutely gross. You know, I, look, I, I'm sure that uh, Zelensky is in a very hard place, but all he talks about right now is throwing more lives to the graves. Frankly, no strategy, no self-awareness, no situational awareness. Okay, it's very sad because the United States talked him out of a peace agreement in March 2022. That was Zelensky's chance, and he lost it. He was inexperienced. You know, when you the United States comes and tells you, we have your back, you, you know, you tend to believe it if you're inexperienced. I tried to tell him, by the way, I, you know, I, I really tried to tell the Ukrainians, look, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been through lots of U.S. wars, Vietnam War, Nicaragua, uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, Syria. They never win. Are you kidding? Do you really want to end up like Afghanistan? And oh. they didn't believe me. They just thought, oh, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, so they didn't want to hear any of this. But I was telling them the hard facts about American wars, and they didn't want to hear it. Oh. Uh, besides Russia, uh, I'm not sure that Ukraine actually is such a big topic uh, in uh, in American uh, policy. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, um, it's, it's maybe, maybe definitely the minute, You know, it's a big focus of the political class still 
the military industrial complex and the White House. Maybe for just political reasons that uh, Biden doesn't want to admit what a lousy poker player he is. But the the point is, uh, for the American people, they've had enough. There's no groundswell of support. People don't want that. They want to stop this thing. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Typically, the public doesn't have much say in this. We have almost no public debate. But Biden's popularity is really collapsing. And if the uh, unhappiness with Biden's foreign policy is very, very clear. So maybe even public opinion is going to start playing a role because we're now in an election year. Um, I would like to ask you to clear the position on China, because when I look both at the Republicans or at the Democrats, I would say that their views on China are very similar. So they actually have very hostile views uh, towards China. Uh, now there was a summit, uh, APEC, where uh, both presidents, Biden and Xi Jinping, met. Um, do you see any, any decline in tension, any hopes that actually the relations, they are probably not going to be friendly, but let's say at least stabilize and, and would be less, less threatening for the world? I'll tell you an interesting thing. When uh, President Xi came to this APEC summit in San Francisco, he met uh, 200 U.S. business leaders and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't think they would give an American president a standing ovation, but they gave President Xi a standing ovation. Why? China is their biggest market. They both produce in China, they sell in China, they make a lot of money in China, and they want normal relations. What, what is happening is two things. One, we have a kind of security class in America who uh, are all about uh, American dominance, American hegemony, America being number one. It's a very strange group of people, uh, but this is uh, our foreign policy establishment. Then we have politicians who basically uh, think that, and it's very particular, uh, Trump in 2016 won the election by winning swing states in the middle of America, in the American Midwest, which is our industrial zone. And he won it by saying, China took your jobs away. Mm -hmm. And when he made narrow victories in those states, the Democrats said, oh, we have to attack China in order to compete politically with Trump. So there are two reasons for the anti-China sentiment in the United States. One and in the political class, one is this idea of America being the only dominant country. Well, I mean, you know, you know, unless you're playing a board game like the game of risk, you don't get to be the dominant country in the world when there are other big countries around. So this is arrogance again, very misguided. Then there is this protectionist politics. Uh, which uh, tries to appeal to a few swing states in the U.S. elections. The upshot of this is that the political class, both Democrats and Republicans, are pretty united against China, pretty ignorant from my experience. They don't know China. Oh. They don't know Chinese history. They don't have any perspective. They play a dangerous game like when uh, our Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi flew to Taiwan. So stupid. Sorry. Just why do you want to provoke another thank superpower? You, thank you for saying that. Because no, we so have the same stupid. representatives who are also provoking China no, in this in this country. No, okay, don't provoke China. Be respectful. Just have normal relations. Don't provoke a superpower. Why? What is in it to poke a superpower? It's stupid. People should think, you know, if there's some, even if you think there's a bully, which China's not, but if you think there's a bully in the schoolyard and you're a, you know, a little kid and you think they're the bully, is it really smart to go poking them and say, 
you're a bully. I hate you. No, you're going to get hurt in the end. So you need some common sense. And China's not even bullying. China is just big, successful, dynamic, actually a good trade partner for Europe. So we should treat it normally, respectfully. And uh, the U.S. anxieties should not be Europe's anxieties. This is another area where European politicians mm -hmm. are just repeating the words of American politicians. And you know, I know behind the scenes, it's although it's obvious, you know, why does van der Leyen repeat words almost like Biden? Because she feels that her job is to be with the United States. Maybe she hopes the United States appoints her as the Secretary General of NATO or something. I don't know oh, what goodness. it is. No, but that's what, what she hopes maybe. So this is where Europe makes a big mistake, just like it did make a big mistake in Ukraine. It would make a big mistake of trying to make an enemy out of China. That's a completely ridiculous losing proposition. Uh, my last question, because time, our time is coming up, I have to reflect one very current event you already mentioned, and that's uh, the elections in Argentina. Yes. Because let's say that uh, the elected president is an unusual personality. Um, how, how do you view this situation? Um, is there a danger for, for BRICS or, or maybe for other Latin American countries with his very strange suggestions as for foreign policy, as for economics. Yeah, of course, time will tell. One thing is uh, he won the presidency, but has uh, no uh, control over the Congress. Uh, his small parties, and at least for the moment, doesn't have any kind of governing coalition in the Congress. So maybe his... Uh, ability to uh, do things will require a much broader coalition of forces, and that could be a, a constraint. But let me just say first, Argentina is a country that has been unstable for its whole history, going back to the 1820s, ever since independence. Argentina has messed up more currencies, had more inflation, and more instability than any other place on the entire planet. This guy won, not because of what he says, but because of disgust with the outgoing government, which was delivering inflation of triple digits, uh, more than 100%. You can't really win an election when inflation is a uh, triple digit. And I know Argentina quite well uh, and actually worked with the finance minister just before this one. And he ended up, he was doing a good job and he ended up being not forced out. He resigned, unfortunately, uh, but he resigned because his own, I would say, corrupt politicians in his own party were uh, rejecting the normal policies that he was trying to promote. So Argentina is now in yet another cycle of instability. Uh, all my professional career as an economist, I've been watching Argentina in amazement because it's it's not an impoverished country by any means. And it's you know got huge natural wealth and, uh, and very smart people, um, well-educated uh, class of people. But it has made such a political mess repeatedly. And this could be yet another one. I don't want to say on the first day after the election of uh, this guy that he'll really govern the way he campaigned because sometimes they become a lot more responsible. But it could be that, he's, <laughs> that he is what he says he is, in which case uh, Argentina is going to face some real troubles. I don't. I, it, it's regrettable because I'm I'm a a fan of the BRICS. I would like to see them work. Argentina is a new member of the BRICS group. Uh, whether this guy stays in or out of the BRICS or gets kicked out of the BRICS, everything remains to be seen. Uh, but I uh, 
I only hope that this guy was making this as a persona, not as a real politics, because uh, his real politics, uh, if delivered this way, would be very, very detrimental to Argentina. The office in 2021, rather than trying to de-escalate, he called for NATO enlargement and reinforced the U.S. push to expand eastward. Putin strongly pushed back. Biden pushed back. The U.S. signed several statements in 2021 confirming that NATO would enlarge. I think this was all absolutely irresponsible. Russia masked troops on its border and put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement on December 17th, 2021, based on no NATO enlargement. The Biden administration formally replied that it was not willing to negotiate over that issue in a, a response in January. Then Russia invaded on February 24th, 2022, making clear that it was the failure to reach an understanding on the NATO question that was central to Russia's action. Four weeks later, Zelensky declared that Ukraine was accepting of neutrality. In other words, the initial Russian invasion brought Ukraine to the negotiating table. And during the second half of March, with the Turkish government being the mediators, Russia and Ukraine hammered out a peace agreement Incredibly, the United States blocked it because the United States told the Ukrainian government, you fight on because American policymakers had two ideas. One was that Ukraine should not be neutral. It should be a NATO country. And second, that the war would be won by some combination of Western armaments and financial sanctions. And so the U.S. ratcheted up the war Putin said, no, we don't stand down, we fight, and mobilized hundreds of thousands of Russians in the summer of 2022. And since then, we've been on a path of military escalation. I resent the fact, as a citizen threatened by this, that Biden has not negotiated over NATO and that Biden and Putin have not talked once, as far as we know, since February 24th, 2022. You know, when two sides are fighting, they need to talk and negotiate, but that's rejected. The hardliners in the United States, Newland, Blinken, Sullivan, Biden, say, why negotiate? We just escalate. We'll defeat Russia. This is, in my view, utterly reckless and irresponsible. First, it leads to the destruction of Ukraine, and second, it risks the escalation to nuclear war. So I'm very unhappy about this, and I very much resent that the mainstream media, like the New York Times, repeats the falsehood all the time that this was an unprovoked action on February 24th, 20. 22, seemingly wanting us to be without any context or history to understand where this conflict came from and how it can end. And a newspaper like the New York Times has a responsibility to tell the truth, and they're not doing it. Indeed. As citizens, we have the right, you know, a country is not looking after in the U.S. the prosperity of its own citizens going out, conducting these irresponsible wars when we don't have time with other things with the environment. Ironically, what seems to be behind it all is this insistence on a unipolar world, insistence on dominance. And while the U.S. wants to hold on to its status as a reserve currency, it seems under those economic sanctions that U.S. has also suffered, it might even be hastening, strengthening strengthening the currencies of other countries. Well, the basic point is the U.S. has 4.1% of the world population. So how could it presume to be the world leader? You know, the U.S. is a powerful country. It's a rich country, but it doesn't run the world and it should not aspire to run the world. That's a kind of madness. And the U.S. ideology for a long time has been that the U.S. should run the world. It's to my mind, unbelievable. But then again, I've spent most of my career outside the U.S. seeing the other 
95.9% of the world, and I know that the other 95% of the world doesn't want the United States to run the world. It's not against the United States. It just says, let us have our own part of the world. We don't want you running the world. We don't want you deciding what our government is, who we are, how we rule ourselves. You know, you're just one place. And this, the United States leaders don't understand. They're very arrogant. They're very ignorant because of the two big oceans. They're very unaware of the history of other parts of the world. And we end up with this arrogant and naive and dangerous foreign policy because there's no doubt the United States is rich and powerful and it makes lots of weapon systems. And I'm 68 years old and the United States has been at war almost every year of my life from Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and Nicaragua and Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Libya and now Ukraine. Come on, give it a break. And the U.S. is also experiencing the reality that other places in the world are catching up on technology, indeed leading on technologies as well. And China's a very successful, very industrious, very hardworking society, which in the last 40 years has gone from poverty to a very significant world important economy. And the U.S. has a very hard time accepting that. The U.S. attitude, if you listen to congressmen who don't seem to know anything, is, oh, if China's successful, it must be because they're cheating. What about because they're saving more than 40% of GDP that the Chinese people have been engaging in a remarkable upgrading of education? Hundreds of thousands of PhDs minted each year. Massive scientific research programs. Come on, this is the truth. And so this arrogance is not allowing the truth to come through. But you mentioned one specific point, which is the role of the U.S. dollar, part of the U.S. strength after World War II is, well, the U.S. was basically the only economy standing, and it was a technologically advanced, rich, large economy, the world's largest. And the dollar was really the only internationally usable currency for quite a long time. So the dollar system became the center of how you do international trade. When you trade in goods, they're denominated in dollars. When you buy the imports, you pay in dollars, meaning you use accounts in U.S. dollars, typically in the U.S. banking system. When the transaction is closed, it's closed through the so-called SWIFT interbank system. And so the U.S. has had a what France long ago called an exorbitant privilege that it could print a lot of money because the rest of the world was holding dollars, using dollars. The dollar was the basis of the world economy. That's changing now. And it's changing for three basic reasons. One is the share of the U.S. in the world economy is diminishing. So this means that the predominance of the U.S. is bound to diminish. The second is technologically settlements are going to occur in all sorts of ways other than through U.S. banks and so-called digital currencies, especially central bank digital currencies, will mean other ways to make settlements. We'll settle in renminbi when we buy in China or settle in rubles or settle in rupees when trade is with India and so forth. So there will be multiple currencies. And then the third part, which is really a matter of a bad set of decision making, the U.S. has militarized the dollar, meaning that usually you think about money, well, you have it, you can use it, you can spend it. But the United States has come to say, if we don't like you, you don't necessarily have access to your money anymore if it's in our banks. So the U.S. froze the dollar holdings of Russia. The U.S. has frozen the dollar holdings of Venezuela. The U.S. froze the dollar holdings of Afghanistan. My advice to any government that's not getting along with the U.S. government is be careful about your money because the U.S. might come in and freeze your money. And so countries are looking to hold their reserves in other ways now. Perfectly understandable. And I think that this is another part of the move to a multi-currency international system from a dollar-based international system. And you mentioned the possibility of a reserve currency being the renminbi. And so There's other things that are not often reported about China. One, and I know that you've written about this as well, is that 
they're stepping in where America's policy of destabilizing and it's destructive. China, in some cases in the Middle East, is stepping in as a peacemaker, and it's less expensive if we can achieve peace. Well, probably the most remarkable diplomatic achievement of recent years, I would say, is China brokering a peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. In the American idea, those two countries were implacable foes. They could never agree. And for the United States, Iran was the enemy and Saudi Arabia was the ally. But the whole idea of U.S. foreign policy is you bring countries under your authority as an ally of the United States, like Saudi Arabia, and you fight your enemies on the other side. But China has a different idea, which is that Saudi Arabia and Iran had no fundamental reasons for this dissension, but they have plenty of reasons for cooperation. For one thing, they're both being hard hit by climate change. They need to cooperate because the water crisis is quite severe. They're both hydrocarbon economies. They need an energy transformation, which is very profound. And so the Chinese facilitated a reconciliation between the two. I'm very happy about that reconciliation, by the way. The fighting between the bitterness between between Iran and Saudi Arabia divided Western Asia. It contributed to an absolutely devastating war in Yemen, in which the United States gave its military support that killed a lot of people. And uh, it destabilized a region that needs a lot of economic transformation and technological upgrading and change. And so this agreement is really a big help for the whole region, not only for the two countries involved. And China gets a lot of credit, in my view, for having the wisdom to see that that was a conflict that could be solved, not just exacerbated, but the U.S. approach was always to push at it. Uh, even when the U.S. made an agreement with Iran, the, the nuclear agreement called the JCPOA, the U.S. government walked away from it. And then it maintained sanctions on Iran because the U.S. is not really serious at making peace most of the time. It's got an us versus them mentality, and I find that very destructive and not in the U.S. interest. Yes, and I hope that China maintains this sensible approach because it's dangerous what's happening now in Taiwan. And just help us understand the situation like and that through line between you know, these proxy wars and what could happen in China. Well, the situation in Taiwan is like the situation in Ukraine very explosive, very dangerous, and it requires cool heads to avoid a conflict. The fact of the matter is that actually all three governments, let me say the United States, uh, Taiwan, and China, have a policy that there's one China. And whether it is the government in Taiwan or the government in Beijing, they both say there's one China. They disagree on what happened in 1949 and how China should be governed, but they don't say there are two countries. And the United States, when it established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, very clearly said that there is one China and has one China policy. And that is how to keep peace and uh, to make sure that this tension between Beijing and Taipei does not boil over to open conflict. But the United States started to play games with this. It started to form a military alliance with Taiwan, in effect, which is really coming into a military alliance uh, in the middle of one country. And this is an extremely dangerous and imprudent thing to do. And Biden starts talking about how we're going to defend Taiwan. And the American politicians talk about how a war is coming. It's all utterly reckless, irresponsible. And what we should have is trying to reduce tensions, diffuse tensions through negotiation, through talk, through peace building ideas, rather than stoking the idea that some conflict is inevitable. A conflict would be devastating, of course, first and foremost for Taiwan, but actually for the whole world. And so this needs to be avoided and we need cool heads and we shouldn't have American politicians saber rattling. We should not have Speaker Nancy Pelosi fly to Taiwan after the Chinese government has repeatedly said, don't do that. Don't provoke. Don't stir up things. 
don't make conflicts where there don't have to be conflicts. But the United States leadership doesn't listen very well. It's the same thing that when Putin said many, many, many times, do not expand NATO to Ukraine. The United States, oh, sorry, we don't hear you. It's, you have nothing to say about that. That's none of your business. And then war comes. This is very typical of American foreign policy because American foreign policy leaders are too arrogant and they don't listen. Yes. And now, 61 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis, you'd think we learned our lesson. And of course, America would never accept a military alliance on its doorstep, you know, say coming down from Canada or something like that. Well, of course, when Cuba aligned with the Soviet Union in 1960, the U.S. idea was invade. That's it. It didn't say, oh, Mr. Castro, you can do what you want. It's an open door. If you want to be with Soviet Union, that's fine with us. No, it said, well, we invade. So that was 1961. In 1962, in the repercussions of that and in a really reckless gamble and reckless action by the Soviet Union putting missiles into Cuba, this whole conflict escalated to just the brink of nuclear war and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then in 1963, both President Kennedy and Soviet Chairman Nikita Khrushchev said, you know, we have to pull back from the brink. We have to live together. We should not be coming to the edge of global nuclear war. And they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in the summer of 1963, proving that even at the height of the Cold War, if the mindset is right, you can make peace. And that's the mindset that we need now. Yes, it seems like the neocon mindset never really went away. You know, just help us understand, because to my mind, you know, Ukraine is not indispensable for the U.S., right? It's just this idea of NATO enlargement. But there's other forces behind the scenes that are, you know, profiting or pushing. And I understand that Zelensky, you know, secured $110 billion in U.S. aid and, of course, humanitarian financial military support. Also, like key partnerships with, you know, the BlackRock venture capital firm, Goldman Sachs to privatize Ukrainian assets. So that would then deepen the country's debt. So help us understand that a little, the path forward, how do we get out of this? Well, when the debate raged initially in the 1990s about the wisdom or lack of wisdom of NATO enlargement, which was contrary to what we had promised and was not wise, a lobbying campaign took place in the United States led by the military industrial complex. Very crude. That's how American politics works. Bring out the big bucks. So it was Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and other big companies became the lobbyists. And then, you know, American congressmen, they salute money. They salute campaign contributions. They salute the lobbyists. And so this is how American politics works. There are always financial interests that are also playing a role here. So we have a mix of ideology, confusion, lack of historical sense, arrogance, and money all stirring the pot. It has very little to do with the American people, though. The American people are not asked about anything. The votes on money for Ukraine are generally almost secret because they're not really debated. They're just measures stuck into some other piece of legislation so that you never have to debate the fact that we've spent more than $110 billion so far on Ukraine and nobody's really been asked about it. Nothing of the American people haven't really been asked. So this is how American politics works. Now, what should be done? This war should end by the United States saying that NATO will not enlarge and Russia saying we take our troops home. That's the core of this. That was available in December 2021. It was available in March 2022, and it's still available now. It doesn't solve many, many other issues. What happens to the territories? What happens to Crimea? These are for negotiations. But the basic idea is that the two superpowers back off and that the war stops and that we go to political solutions, not military solutions. And that should be our priority. And so finally, as you think about the future, uh, the prospect of nuclear war, the kind of world that we're leaving the next generation, what would you like young people to know, preserve, and remember? 
young people should lead the way to a safer, cooperative, peaceful, and environmentally sustainable and fair world. This is the point. We need to build the future we want, not to feel trapped in this mindless cycle of violence and environmental destruction. The problems that we face are solvable, and they are not driven by the needs of the people. They're driven by greed or power-seeking of elites. And we need to have a new generation say, this is not working. We want a world that is at peace, that is shared in prosperity, and that solves the environmental crises, which have become so deep and are neglected in part because we are wasting our time, our lives, our resources on these useless wars. No, let me say it. it's the first book of Western political science is the better way to say it, because Plato had written The Republic a generation earlier. But it's the first book of political science. It is paired with his ethics, Nicomachean ethics, as two joined volumes, because for Aristotle, ethics and politics were the same. Of course, in 15... 14, I think it is, Machiavelli wrote a very different political science. He wrote a handbook for the prince, which was about how to maintain power. And political science in the West began to be the science of maintaining or managing power, not the science of producing the good. And in fact, Machiavelli was teaching the prince. He was actually making a job application back to the Medicis because he had been dismissed from the Medicis, wanting a job back that he was advising the Medicis how to hold power in Florence. Later in the next century, one of the most influential texts in Western cultural history was written by Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan. And this was written in 1640 as Western science was taking shape. And Hobbes wanted a scientific theory of human beings, but modeled as individual atoms that collide with each other. Because for Hobbes, there was no longer a cultivation of virtue, but rather each individual with insatiable desires. So Hobbes's model of human nature is that it is simply unbounded desire. It can't be taught to moderate desire. It can't be cultivated for virtue. It is individualistic and it is insatiable. And so Hobbes said, unless there is an overarching power, people will kill each other. And so we need a Leviathan, he said, to stop human nature from committing non-stop violence. It was a very pessimistic view of human nature, but notice the main point is no longer was there any idea of developing virtue. That was deemed to be impossible. Instead, one needed institutions to reflect harsh reality. This is the flip of philosophy. It's no longer about cultivating the good. It is about controlling the bad. Then interestingly and importantly, this was amplified at the beginning of the 18th century, first by a very uh, influential public intellectual, Bernard Mandeville, who wrote an essay in London called The Fable of the Bees. And in The Fable of the Bees, the most aggressive bees win, but they make the hive powerful and great. And if you try to control the avarice or the vice or the aggression of the bees, the hive actually dies. So this was now a philosophy of empire, that power-seeking was good because it would make the society 
powerful and wealthy and able to dominate over the other bees. So it was taking Hobbes and adding another element. One beehive taking dominance over others. And clearly this was a philosophy that appealed to the emerging British Empire. Then came Adam Smith six decades later in 1776. And he said, in agreement with Hobbes and in agreement with Mandeville, that human nature is individualistic, tastes are unbounded, desire is a great motivator, but market forces will tame all of that because market forces will force a kind of competition that will lead to a socially beneficent outcome. The point is the Anglo-Saxon philosophy broke free of more than 1,800 years of Western tradition. The Western tradition from Aristotle and Christianity was a tradition of the common good, virtue, and care for the poor. By the, with the rise of the British Empire, the philosophy came, became the benefits of power as a philosophy. And then even the idea that this would lead to, quote, the common good. But there are two more steps that are important to state. The poor became an enemy because now they were a drag on society. So John Locke, one of our most esteemed philosophers, wanted very harsh treatment for the poor so that they would not be burdens on society. And then came Malthus. Thomas Malthus wrote after Adam Smith one generation later in 1798. And he proposed something even darker, which is that those hives, those different societies, are actually in competition for survival with each other because there are more people produced than can be supported. And so life is a battle for survival. And trying to help the poor is inevitably to fail, because there will just be more poor people. That was his iron law of population. And it's, that led in the next step. Darwin took that idea brilliantly from a scientific point of view to understand natural selection. But the later 19th century philosophers took that idea as a struggle across nations. And that now nations or peoples or races were in the struggle for survival. And this became known as social Darwinism. And the idea was not only should there be no beneficence, if you help your own poor, you will weaken your society compared to others. And indeed, you're in a struggle for survival. And this gave rise to the worst crimes of history. Because Nazism actually is a philosophy, which it was, was based on social Darwinist pseudoscience. And this idea, the German people will survive or the Slavic people will survive. And so this is a war even to extermination. Now this kind of idea led to the worst cruelties, but we are still in a mindset in the Western world where it is competition and struggle that is the absolute underpinning of society. When I studied economics, I was taught about perfect competition. I was never taught even one minute about perfect cooperation. The idea doesn't even exist in economics. It's not even developed in one paper that I know of. 
because the idea of cooperation as a norm doesn't exist. It happened, this notion of letting greed motivate action perhaps did generate the spirit of innovation to some extent. But the way that it was championed and taught, of course, led to the worst excesses. So the world became rich, and those who were rich became devoid of benevolence and compassion. And a terrible writer in the United States who became quite popular, Ayn Rand, a kind of uh, popular philosopher among young people and among many politicians, wrote a famous essay about the virtues of selfishness. So selfishness became the virtue, actually. That's the literal title of an essay. It's unbelievable, and she is championed by many still. These novels are unbearable to read, but they are part of our philosophy. So I went on too long, I know, because the sign told me to stop five minutes ago. But, so that's not very benevolent of me. But let me say the following. I believe we've had a deviation from the right path in Western civilization. There are roots of Western culture that we can really use to find a path of virtue and politics that is ethical. But the Anglo-Saxon version deeply lost this tradition. And there are many fascinating reasons for this, but it was mainly the rise of power of the British Empire which was in many ways an extremely nasty empire. And the United States learned everything it knows from the British Empire because it aims to be the continuation of the British Empire after World War II. And this is what needs to end, a world that can return to the common ethical principles of virtue. Now, let me just conclude by saying I am hopeful that this can actually happen. And I think you at the table need to help lead that. And we need to help explain these things. And when President Xi Jinping launched last year the Global Civilizations Initiative, I think that this is actually an important opening that is very positive because China has said we should go back to our roots of culture to find a way forward, which I very much subscribe to. And the GCI, or Global Civilizations Initiative, is an invitation across civilizational wisdom. And I hosted a meeting in Athens last month, co-hosted, with the Academy of Athens, a Aristotle-Confucius symposium on ancient wisdom for modern challenges that brought together Chinese and Western philosophers. We didn't have Buddha properly at the table except one very distinguished Buddhist thinker from Cambodia, but we need more of that. At the end of this meeting, we agreed that we would have a second symposium. This time, I hope it is the Aristotle Buddha Confucius Symposium in Shufu, uh, in Shandong province in July. I hope we could participate together in that. Uh, we will be back for that. Many philosophers are interested in that. I will be in Shufu in next month uh, for the Nishan uh, forum, which is uh, also a philosophical forum, but the 
Shandong government has asked to host the follow-up meeting of the Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius uh, symposium. And I believe that this idea of East and West deep philosophical traditions, finding the deep humanity that is common across them is extremely important and powerful and can really contribute to an understanding which right now doesn't exist. And I think the failings of this understanding are overwhelmingly on the Western side, if I may say so, because we are steeped in a philosophy of competition and even war. And this mindset is taken as given, but it is actually a recent phenomenon. It is an imperial phenomenon, and it needs to be put aside. So I, I believe that this actually can be done. Can I have two more minutes? <laughs> because I want to talk about net zero by 2050. And first to say how much I admire what Dr. Shaw proposed. And uh, I, is the book in English also or in Chinese? OK. We're going to have to get me an English translation somehow. Uh, if we can, <laughs> but I'm very eager also to read your forthcoming paper. Let me add a couple of things that I think are central, but I think they're already exactly in your uh, climate club idea. It is not possible to reach net zero one country at a time, least of all for an island. We need an interconnected energy system, region by region, because if you are tapping renewable energy, it's intermittent. So it's sunny here or windy here. This needs interconnection. And East Asia should be interconnected in a common grid. There is a mainland China program called GuideCo. Cooperation Organization that is the China State Grid engineers who are doing analytical work on interconnecting regional grids for Africa, for South America, for North America, for Europe, and for Asia. This is very important work. Taiwan should be connected to the mainland in a power grid. And the mainland should be connected with Mongolia, and it should be connected with the ASEAN countries. And with some system. It would be very region, the economic powerhouse of the world, rather than a battleground, because this region has everything if it works together. And it could lose everything if it views the region as a battleground. I think everyone in this region can understand this. The only one that does not is my country, actually. But the US needs to be told, let us solve our problems. We know how to discuss. Don't meddle because you will make a mess. This is actually the truth. This is true about Japan. It's true about 
of zero carbon energy and all the cooperation that go would the regional cooperation, the regional structure, and pose and probably roadmaps that show the physical interconnectedness, what technologies, where, as I've been saying, of a plan. It's 80% fossil fuel. What plan is that? Nothing. Please, <laughs> don't encourage them. So, show fantastic or work I was, Sonia and I were just in Beijing with them a couple of days ago. We'll come back for a meeting that they're hosting on September 26th uh, for a worldwide meeting on energy interconnections. I think that this is really uh, uh, ab absolutely at the core. So I agree with everything that you said, and I think that it's absolutely the way forward, and in that polycentric world, there's a concept which I find very useful. It's a concept adopted by the European Union, but a concept that actually started with the Roman Catholic Church, and that is the concept of subsidiarity, which is that we need governance at all levels. So we need global governance, regional governance, national governance, local governance, you put each problem at the lowest level possible, closest to the people, where it can be solved, but not below the level at which it can be solved. So the power grid cannot be solved at the national level, it must be solved at the regional level. The targets for decarbonization must be solved at the global level, and so forth. And the idea of subsidiarity is that we have this multiple levels. We have global governance. We have a global government that can do certain things and not other things. We have regional government. We have national government. We have local 